Welcome to this first presentation covering um, the topic of labor law. When I was in law school, I had two separate uh, courses on labor law, and I wrote um, uh, several papers on the topic. And even at that point, I really had a very rudimentary understanding of how labor law works. And so I'm going to try to distill um, some really complicated and sophisticated and kind of strategic thinking concepts into uh, just a few hours of material. And I apologize in advance because I'm sure I'm not going to do the subject justice. The first thing that I would say, um, if you are an HR professional, is that if you have any idea that there may be some union activity, uh, the first thing that you need to do is let your legal department know, or if you don't have in-house legal department with your particular company, to secure outside a counsel. It's really, really important to do this uh, because there are lots of mistakes that can be made by non-legal professionals that can be very expensive and can be very, very detrimental to the business. Uh, so that's definitely a, a have to do under those circumstances. Please, please don't think for a moment you can do this alone. Um, the most sophisticated HR person alive is not going, unless that person also is an attorney practicing this area, is just not going to be up to the task. Task. It's also true that in a generalist attorney is not up to the task of representing a law firm, excuse me, a, a business when there is union activity. I would even say that the average um, employment attorney isn't up for the task. This is a very, very specialized area and you need labor attorneys to handle it. Uh, back when I started practicing, um, I graduated from law school in 1990 and so I, I did some practice as a law student um, in the late 80s. And so some of the uh, attorneys that I was fortunate enough to work with uh, had started practicing law in the 70s. Um, and they could remember the, the time where labor activity was a real thing. It was a real part of the Texas economy. That there, And this was in Houston, so there was more activity of a union nature just inherently in Houston uh, because uh, it's a more blue-collar type uh, city. But... Um, much of that work had ceased to exist by the late 80s and certainly into the 90s was a much less important part of the legal environment. Um, those attorneys to a person longed for labor work. Um, they happily did employment work, but uh, there's really nothing in the law that at least I know of that compares to the excitement, to the drama, to the fun of labor law. It is a tremendously rewarding area of practice. Um, and uh, so I, I, I offer that to you for, for your uh, review and, and, and consideration. Um, obviously, the, the place to practice in that area is not going to be Dallas, Texas. Um, but it is, it is a very interesting area. And hopefully, when I talk about it, you'll capture some hints of that. Um, to see why it's such a fascinating and uh, uh, requiring so many different skills and so many different pieces of a puzzle. Uh, but again, we won't be able to dive very far into it because uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon your perspective, this isn't a practice area that is likely to uh, be a very significant part of the HR practice that you may have. Okay. Well, the first thing to say is that labor law and employment law have so very little to do in common with each other. Um, in almost every way, other than the fact you're dealing with human beings who work for a business, the, the uh, particular focuses are different. I'm just going to just throw out some things that are different. One difference is the statutes. Um, the uh, National Labor Relations Act was written in the 1940s, so it's uh, 20 years older than uh, Title VII, and there have while well, there have been some amendments to those laws, um, even you know, getting close to the time period of Title VII, there were just different concerns, different vocabulary, different focuses that existed in those cultures compared to the cultures that we see in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It's almost like when you're talking about the NLRA that you're almost going back into a time 
machine in, in kind of thinking about the world through a different lens. It's not a better lens or a less good lens. It's just a different lens. And it is a different way to view the world than we see even in the 60s and 70s and 80s where we had a fairly significant amount of litigation in the employment area. Another big difference is that employment law is basically about litigation. It's about uh, presenting your arguments to a judge and a jury. Um, there is some, of, n n there are no juries in labor law, but there is some of, of presenting your arguments to judges, but that's not actually what labor law is primarily about. Labor law is about running elections. It's about being the campaign uh, person, uh, the equivalent of, um, you know, the, the campaign chair, the campaign uh, leader of a presidential campaign or a senatorial campaign. You are thinking about slogans, you're thinking about stump speeches, you're thinking about what your messages are going to be, what your data is going to be, you're thinking about how to sell the workers on your vision for what this workplace ought to be like. It is very similar to running a campaign. So who you're trying to persuade are just ordinary citizens uh, that happen to work in this particular facility. Um, and then the other time where, where you um, work as a labor legal professional is in the campaign negotiation process where you are collectively bargaining over things. So this is about um, negotiation and strategies there. So it's a very, very different set of legal skills um, than you would see in an employment law uh, practice. Another big difference is that employment law is um, tends to have pretty significant number of women practice in that area. There are definitely men who practice in the area, but it has tended to become an area that has more women than men, especially if you're looking at younger attorneys. Labor law is overwhelmingly male. And so there is just a difference in terms of, of demographics. Uh, when the labor law dried up, then certainly labor attorneys who were overwhelmingly men became employment attorneys. Um, and so certainly older employment attorneys often are men just for that reason. Uh, I don't think that there's necessarily a skill set that make men better for this or women better for that. I don't happen to buy into that, uh, that notion. But there are um, different comfort levels and different um, aspects to it. M while employment law issues can develop in any type of employment context, Labor issues primarily develop in a blue collar environment. And historically, blue collar environments, especially the unionized ones, have been male dominated situations. Assembly lines, the Teamsters, um, things along those lines. And there's no particular reason they have to be male dominated. They just always have been. And maybe that will change, but at this point, um, that tends to be the population. And it, it not only are the, the people who work in the organized facilities male, but in many cases, the supervisors and managers are also male. Of course, in the employment law context, yes, employment law issues can arise in those environments, but they can also arise in a white collar or pink collar environment. And so they're much less likely to be male dominated work situations. But whether you are a man or a woman, or you're an HR professional, or a paralegal, or an attorney, um, there's no reason to think that a, a woman can't be every bit as successful in the labor law area as a man, and there's no reason to think that a man can't be every bit as successful in the employment law area as a woman. So let's talk about what collective bargaining is, because this is one of the most important concepts in labor law. And this is the um, idea, well, I guess you, if we kind of take the, the words apart for a second, we've got, of course, the word bargaining. Most of us are familiar with that word. We bargain all the time. If you go to, say, buy a used car from somebody, there's going to be a give and take. I mean, they have the sticker price posted on the car, but we all know that's just a, a, a beginning salvo in the process of deciding what the price is going to be and so then you come back with a price and then the car dealership comes back with a price and there's a back and forth back and forth and then eventually sometimes they're going to arrive at a, at a price uh, maybe you will have said well if you throw in the the, the floor mats or if you uh, throw in this feature or that feature 
And maybe you reach an agreement, maybe you don't, maybe you walk away. But anyway, that's that give and take process, that bargaining process. Um, and certainly as an HR professional or as a paralegal, you're going to be involved in negotiating lots of different types of contracts. This is just one category of the contracts that you will be uh, possibly involved with if your facility happens to have a union involved. So that's the idea behind bargaining, but let's focus a little bit more about this collective bargaining. So let's think about it from the perspective of the union situation. Uh, collective bargaining are the negotiations and agreements between management and labor. So this is, these are the owners of the business. So this would be your role. This would be you as the HR professional, you would be part of the management team, or you as the paralegal or attorney who is supporting the management team. Or if you go to work for a union, you could be perhaps the business agent uh, for the, the union, or maybe the legal professional who's assisting the union. So you could be on the other side. Um, it's a little bit less common to have HR professionals and, and paralegals on this side, but certainly it could happen. So both sides kind of have their, their experts, their folks who are going to advocate for their particular uh, agendas. On the labor team, you're usually going to have a combination of business agents. The, that's the name for the union employees who have been intimately involved in organizing this facility and in uh, seeking to understand the special circumstances, needs, desires, concerns of the people who work in that facility. And in addition to these business agents who not only are experts into that work environment, but they're also experts in the collective bargaining process. They know kind of how this is supposed to play out, what, what, what the rules of the road are, what can happen, what shouldn't happen, what sometimes does happen, all of those different issues. They're sophisticated, in other words, about uh, labor law. Then there will also be people, these will oftentimes be the shop stewards, the, the people who are most involved in the organizing campaign, but in some sense, they're just ordinary employees. They've been working here at your facility perhaps for years, and there may be really good auto mechanics or really good truck drivers or really good um, typists or whatever it is, but they don't have any particular knowledge or experience with uh, bargaining or even unions necessarily. And so they don't really kind of know what to expect, but they're going to be part of the team because they are going to help the business agents know what the biggest priorities are for the employees. It may be that the employees care most about getting a wage increase, or maybe their biggest concern is job security, or perhaps their greatest concern is health care. Uh, it can be lots of different concerns, and it's not that probably the employees want to accomplish all those things, but the idea about what's most important and how to go about accomplishing those things um, really at the end of the day is going to be something that the employees are going to decide and those union stewards are going to be the voice of those employees. So once management and labor sit down together and start this process, they're going to be negotiating over things like um, wages, hours, and other benefits, fringe benefits like the amount of vacation time available, what are paid holidays, um, what uh, are the attendance rules, uh, what are the benefits in terms of retirement and, and um, health care insurance and things along those lines. All of those bundles of things that motivate all of us kind of to come to work. Those are subjects of that negotiating process. If the parties, the management and the labor, are able to reach a contract, we call that a collective bargaining agreement, many times abbreviated to CBA. And if, again, but this requires both sides to agree, um, you can't have a contract unless the uh, labor group agrees and the management group agrees. But if both agree to the same terms, then you have a contract. And that contract is going to replace the default setting that we've talked about in previous lectures, that at-will employment situation. Now, it's not automatic 
at will employment is going to continue until this collective bargaining agreement goes into effect. And sometimes the two parties can't reach an agreement. Management and labor just can't reach a consensus. And so we may stay with an at will employment situation for a very long time, perhaps forever. Or the parties can quickly reach a collective bargaining agreement. That's going to turn on, I guess, the personalities and agendas of both the management and the labor. Um, so let's go to our next slide. Let's think a little bit about history here. Um, this is a diff, I'm going to, before I go into the specifics, this is a difficult topic to organize in part because we're going to look at a series of statutes. Uh, for the most part, they are amendments of the National Labor Relations Act, which is oftentimes called the Wagner Act. Um, by the way, the names that we'll see are mainly the names of various congressmen their surnames who were instrumental in passing a variety of these statutes. So that's kind of the history of the names that we'll be seeing. Um, in some sense, the names don't make a difference. I mean, we could just say everything is the National Labor Relations Act, and we wouldn't be wrong if we did that. But I think it is also helpful to t for House to understand the story of where we've gotten to where we, we are, to kind of see the back and forth and the evolution. But as we go through this, I'm going to say it sometimes. Listen, I'm, I'm giving you this information for context, but this is the only part you need to know. Or you don't need to know any of this for a test, but I think it's going to help you make sense of what's coming next. So be on the lookout and mark your documents. You may even want to pause the video when I say, you know, this is just FYI purposes, I'm not going to test you on it, or this is the part you need to know. I want to make sure you have that information so that you can focus on what you need to study and be most productive. Okay, so let's get started. A lot of this historical stuff I'm not going to test you about. You don't need to know about. Um, you don't need to know anything about these first um, items here. It's certainly true that, um, you know, Unions are primarily a function, at least in our country, of an urban setting, that we only really see unions in urban, perhaps suburban settings. And so when we were primarily an agrarian economy, there just it just wasn't something that existed. I mean, you can have unions in, a, in an agricultural situation. One can imagine that type of, of environment. It just hasn't happened in the United States. It is important, though, that we understand the concept of injunctions. This is going to come up several times. Um, I happen to have this definition on the historical so perspective slide, but it could have happened elsewhere, too. Um, the reason that it's on this slide is that one of the early things that happened when we were looking historically at this topic was that the court system was very anti-union. And one can understand to some extent why that happened because this was a period of time where there was great concern about antitrust issues. Well, what is a union but a trust organization? By trust, I mean it's a monopoly. Um, because what the union is saying is we are the only source of workers you can use. And so you have to make us happy or we're going to strike and then you're going to have to shut down your business. That's like a monopoly idea. The power of monopoly is how the union system works. Well, keep in mind that this was an era that there was great, great concern about monopolies. Again, mainly on the, the production side, um, but the, the analogy was pretty clear that it would, would also potentially apply to when you have it as employees. So injunctions were often the way that early courts would break up unions. We'll see that injunctions today are used in a very different way, but the idea of injunctions, what it's accomplishing in terms of the steps that are taken and what, what the, the, the purview that the, the court's looking at is going to be similar. And of course, injunctions are not just a tool for uh, labor law. In fact, there's, I mean, it's really, we see injunctions really in all practice areas. So let's consider the definition, both from an historical standpoint and uh, what can happen today in a labor dispute. So an injunction is a court order requiring individuals or groups of persons to refrain from performing certain acts, like striking, so this would apply in this situation to a union, that the court has determined will do irreparable harm. So the court is basically saying, don't do X. And uh, if you do do X, you're going to be in contempt of court and I'm going to lock you up. So you might have a situation where um, 
an employer, excuse me, uh, again, well, we'll go back into the 1800s, where um, an employer was concerned that the workers were unionizing, were going to work as one unit and um, speak with one voice, and so uh, they would go on strike and perhaps try to get more, more earnings. And let's say in this particular community, it wouldn't have been possible for the employer to hire other people. And because there would, a sufficiently large portion of this community would be unwilling to cross the, uh, the uh, uh, picket line. So uh, the court might say, well, we're just going to arrest, you know, you, you aren't allowed to, to picket, you aren't allowed to organize in this way. This is a, 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 a monopoly, an unlawful monopoly of, of the union a component. And if you do try to do this, we're going to lock all the people who are supporting this up. That's the idea. You're going to be enjoined from doing this. You'll be in contempt of court once we've issued this order. Um, nowadays, of course, unions are lawful in most circumstances, certainly the vast majority of circumstances. And uh, so we're not looking at courts going in and saying, oh, you can't unionize. But there are things that either employers can do or unions can do that can uh, uh, that a court can issue an order, and then if one or, one or both of the parties breaks that rule, then of course there can be uh, the contempt of court, um, possibly an arrest type situation. So injunctions are definitely a continuing thing. When the injunctions are going to be granted is going to be very different than what we see in this historical perspective. But the power of the injunction continues for sure to this day. Let's talk about yellow dog contracts. Um, I'm an eighth generation Texan and I came from a family of proud Texans and one of the things that my grandparents would have said, they're all passed away now, three of my four grandparents were Texans, is that um, they were yellow dog Democrats growing up. They would never have considered voting for a Republican, and they and when they would say yellow dog Democrats, they didn't mean that that, that dogs were allowed to vote or that they were um, uh, running for office. But their view would be, I'd vote for a yellow dog before I'd vote for a Republican. So that was what a yellow dog Democrat was. Someone who was so staunchly a Democrat that they would not even consider voting for a Republican or anyone else, and that they would instead vote for a dog instead of a uh, Republican. Anyway, that's that's the, 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 the term that you may have heard if you had family members um, in Texas whom, whom you might have heard that expression. This term, yellow dog contracts, has nothing to do with that term. <laughs> so I gave you that story. Hopefully it doesn't confuse you, but um, it's a different meaning associated with that term. What are yellow dog contracts? Well, these are agreements with a provision that the employee does not belong to a union and will not join one. And so in this situation, the employee uh, goes to work for... Uh, the ABC company and the ABC company says Bob we'd love to hire you to work in our factory and these are what we're going to pay you and these are the terms and conditions of your employment but before we hire you we're going to make you sign this document if you don't want to sign it that's fine Bob but you're not going to work here and so in this document you are promising us that you do not belong to a union currently and we're, you're also promising that you're never going to join a union while you work for us and of course if you break the, 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 the terms of this contract, if you do join a union, um, then you will be in breach of the contract and we're going to fire you for it and we'll be able to fire you for it because you breached the terms of the contract. And so that's what a yellow dog contract is in the union context. These were super, super common back in the day. These are now completely unlawful. Uh, but so they went from being very common and completely lawful to completely unlawful at this point in time. So a yellow dog contract is not something you want to enter into. You don't want to be the employer who insists upon it at all. In fact, it would be what is called an unfair labor practice. We'll talk about this. This is a ULP. I'll use this term about 50 times over the next uh, hour or two. Uh, but that's what it stands for, ULP, unfair labor practice. It would be an unfair labor practice for a union to demand, or actually for an employer, I should be employer, I apologize, for an employer to demand that an employee execute a yellow dog contract provision. 
obviously a union wouldn't want the employer to do that. I mean, what would want the employee to do that because the union wants the um, employee to join the union. And so the employer cannot insist upon that. Okay. This isn't something that's routinely done nowadays again, but this is an historical term. And so um, it is important though, just like you need to know the concept of injunction, you do need to know the term yellow dog contracts, even though they're not co commonly, or they're not done at all nowadays, this is just a really important historical concept. Okay, now, Again, if you were taking labor law, we talk about the Sherman Antitrust Act and Clinton Antitrust Act, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what? We're not going to go there because we don't have the, the time to that level of a dive. Um, okay, as the um, uh, economy developed and industrialized and uh, 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 factories became more prevalent, uh, the union activity continued to go and of course there were sweatshops where people were oftentimes paid very little money they oftentimes worked um, in very difficult situations even dangerous situations and um, uh, there was a, a lot of concern about safety and um, you know is this are the were, were the workers being taken advantage of so to speak and so there was an increasing interest in unionization, unionization. You know, we can see another statute here. Um, in the 1930s, we begin to see a change in this area of the law where there suddenly is, you know, we're in the Great Depression now, and we have Franklin Delano Roosevelt as president, and he is very pro-union. He thinks that the unions are going to really help uh, lift the average person up from difficult circumstances, um, that they are going to be able to, through unions, uh, raise the standard of living of the middle class and the lower middle class uh, people. And one of the, the uh, statutes that was designed to do this was the Norris LaGuardia Act. Uh, you've probably heard of the LaGuardia, LaGuardia Airport. Well, LaGuardia was a very important politician out of the state of New York. That's how the uh, airport got its name. This was the statute that made the use of yellow dog contracts illegal. So you can see this actually became unlawful to have yellow dog contracts even before we had the National Labor Relations Act. So we have um, the New Deal. The Franklin Delano Roosevelt is pushing to get um, various public work projects and, and things along those lines, trying to get the uh, the the uh, power of industry uh, to to restart so that the workers can um, have employment, can feed their families, can have decent places to live. And one of those important parts of the New Deal was, well, we can see some of them was regulating prices, having a minimum wage, and collective bargaining rights. But the U.S. Supreme Court at that time was very conservative. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you do not have the constitutional authority to do that. The, um, uh, the, the sticking point was the interpretation of the Commerce Clause in the body of the, of the Constitution. Again, we don't need to really know that, but that's a little interesting fact about that. Um, what happened was that uh, the Franklin Delano, it, it, we think about the U.S. Supreme Court having nine members, and that's the number it has now. That was the number it had when Roosevelt was president. But it's not a part of the Constitution that there be a set number. It's just been our tradition for a very long time. Uh, so Franklin said, well, maybe we can increase the number, and then I can put more uh, more judges who are going to share my perspective on these issues so I can raise the number to 11 or to 13 or something along those lines. He didn't actually do that but uh, some scholars think that because of that concern the members of the Supreme Court started thinking to themselves you know what maybe we ought to just give him what he wants because we don't want him to m mess up the, um, the, the, our, the Supreme Court. So maybe we ought to just kind of do what he wants. At least that's what some historians think motivated kind of the change of heart of the Supreme Court. 
And as a result of this change of heart, the U.S. Supreme Court accepted a greater definition or greater scope of federal regulatory power that would exist through the Interstate Commerce Clause. And so suddenly these things that had been ruled unconstitutional seem to have a chance at actually being constitutional um, under these circumstances. And so in this type of environment is where we see that the uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt again pushed for some labor act, act or labor statute. And the, the statute itself was called the National Labor Relations Act. And it's oftentimes called the NLRA. But probably more commonly, people call it the Wagner Act, because again, uh, Wagner was the a politician who was very involved in um, uh, its successful passage. So we're in the midst of the Great Depression. This is designed to um, hopefully lift some of the people struggling during the Great Depression, lift their economic circumstances. We'll see that the Wagner Act established the National Labor Relations Act, but we'll see there'll be several amendments to the act going forward. It's helpful for the purposes of understanding kind of what happens to think about this initial version of the act as the Wagner Act. So let's see what that law back in 1935 did for um, union, unions and union organizing. I guess the first thing that came to mind is this is the big law. This is the law that we focus on, um, even more important than the amendments, although the amendments are important, and certainly more important than any law that came before. So this is the single most important part of the story that we're going to be talking about. So it guaranteed the rights of employees to organize, which is a way of saying unionize for the purposes of our lecture, think about organize and unionize as synonyms for each other. So you're organizing so that you can function as a unit. And then, of course, once you unionize, then you could bargain collectively. Because, of course, the purpose of unionization isn't just to kind of form some kind of group. I mean, the group has to have a goal, and usually the the, the purpose of the group is to accomplish some kind of economic or maybe safety or some other uh, uh, goal within the workplace. Uh, if you're just organizing just to kind of hang out together, I mean, that's a club that may be a lot of fun, but it really doesn't have much to do with unions. You want to organize so that you can bargain with the employer and hopefully persuade the employer to give you more stuff. And if you can't persuade, then you might do a strike. And that might persuade the employer even more. So part of the Wagner Act was establishing the National Labor Relations Board. You can see this is the NLRB. So it ends with a B because the last word is board. And the NLRA ends with an A because the last word is an act. But the first three words are the same, National Labor Relations, National Labor Relations. So that can be a fairly easy way to keep it straight. Um, this board was established to oversee the process of unionization. This is the equivalent of the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that we've seen time and time again in the context of employment law. Um, this is the equivalent. Now it's set up differently. In lots of ways it's dramatically different, but it is a governmental agency and it does have authority to enforce the, the requirements of this particular statute. So in some respects it's similar. Um, it um, set up a method for resolving complaints about management misconduct. So when, when management, when the owners of the business did something that the statute defined as unfair uh, or unlawful, I guess you could say, then it set up a way that employees and or the union could step in, let the NLRB know, hey, look at what the employer is doing. Maybe, you know, could you stop them from doing that or could you penalize them for doing it? And that is the process that, uh, or that would, that idea is what we see in the Wagoner Act. One of the things that happened was that the Wagoner Act was kind of more successful perhaps than anybody thought it was going to be because it really gave unions an advantage over management. 
unions began to flourish and they were very successful at extracting that monopoly profit that they are designed to be able to accomplish. And as a result of how successful they were, they were able to strike successfully and get lots of goodies by uh, the collective bargaining process. And these strikes were received by the American people, not always in the best of, of uh, or d w with agreement, that these disrupted business. And so uh, the thought in the country was maybe unions are a little bit too powerful right now. And so after Wagner, again, was viewed as very pro-labor, there was kind of a counterbalancing statute. This is the Taft-Hartley. And it's designed to kind of swing, swing the pendulum a little bit more towards the, uh, the, the management side of things. So it's a, you would call it a correction to maybe an overly pro-labor um, answer to questions that Wagner provided. Now, uh, you may disagree with what the political uh, uh, philosophy was in the late 40s about union organizing. I'm just telling you kind of what the politicians were thinking. So again, it, it amended the National Labor Relations Act, so it amended the Wagner Act to make um, the law more employer friendly. And one of the big things that it did was it made it created symmetry. Under Wagner, we had employer unfair labor practices, but there had not been any way that a union could be penalized when it did something that was unfair. And under the Taft-Hartley Act, that changed. Now unions were also going to be held accountable when they did ULPs. The Taft-Hartley Act also established right to work, or the option that states had to be right to work states. We'll talk more about that later. Um, then we see a little bit later, this is I guess a little, quite a bit later, um, about 10 years later, we see that there was a lot of concern about um, union corruption. Um, there were ties that some unions had to organized crime. You've probably heard of uh, Jimmy Hoffa and uh, his ties uh, to perhaps organized crime. There were other uh, unions that were perceived and in some cases were related to organized crime. There were some unions that perhaps had ties to communist organizations. And so the concern that this act was attempting to address was are unions corrupt and how can we clean up unions and how can we make sure that unions function in a way to advance the interest of their rank and file members. In some cases unions had become uh, so that the unions benefited the, uh, the president and the other people in the hierarchy, but really were not responding to the needs of the rank and file. In many cases, unions might be dominated by one family. And so, you know, the, uh, the, the dad was, this, was the uh, president um, and his three sons were the vice president and the secretary and the treasurer. And so it, uh, that they really were able to exert a lot of control. So you can see this, I mean, some people look at this and say, well, this is more, more adjustment to be more employer friendly, but other people would say, well, no, this is all about being union friendly because these unions were doing bad things to the workers. Um, and so again, it kind of, how you view Landrum Griffith can, uh, depend upon kind of how, how, what your interpretation is. But in any event, it did change how unions would, would function internally and it gave more rights to the rank and file members. Again, we'll go through each one of these in more detail. So let's go forward, let's go into the 1970s. We begin to see some changes into the economy. Um, we move into more high tech fields and we see that there's a decline in private sector union, unionization. A part of that may be due to the fact that employers became more aggressive in trying to avoid unions or getting unions uh, to no longer be in facilities. Uh, there was also more globalization. Uh, before, pretty much things that we use in the United States were manufactured in the United States. And so if um, a union plant uh, closed or, or lost business, it might have been losing business to another union plant. 
Uh, but given the fact that we have become more of a global economy, there are many parts of the world where unionization isn't that common, um, in part perhaps because of, of legal protections don't exist for union unionization in those places, or perhaps because there's so much untapped labor resources that a union really isn't going to be able to you know, take advantage of that monopoly profit. Uh, uh, mon monopoly power to to exert that monopoly profit. So for those reasons, uh, the, there's been a pretty significant decrease in the level of private sector unionization. Now what we have seen though is that um, in the public sector, labor unions continue to be really important. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, one reason is that many times government entities do not oppose their workers becoming unionized. Um, after all, these government employee, these government officials who are making the decision are oftentimes elected officials, and they don't necessarily want to anger the union because they don't want to anger the people that support the union who might be voting for them. And as a result, uh, many times government entities kind of take a hands-off approach and say, hey, you workers, you decide for yourselves whether you want to join a union or not. I mean, that's your decision. We're not going to express a preference one way or the other. Another reason perhaps that labor unions have been more successful is that some different rules apply to labor unions compared to private sector unions. Now in this course we don't really focus very much on governmental employment and so I'm not going to talk very much about that. We're going to focus really on that private sector component. But certainly if you do work for a, a government entity as a, a paralegal or an attorney or as an HR professional, just be aware that you Union rules can be very different in a government place. So where do we see continuing private sector union activity? They usually are in the north and um, we see these especially in um, uh, the Northeast and also the Midwest. You'll see it in states like Wisconsin, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, um, New York, Pennsylvania, states along those lines. Um, you don't see it very much in high-tech areas, so you won't probably see it much in Silicon Valley um, or in Seattle, for example, but you will see it in other parts of the northern states, um, typically in a more industrial, manufacturing-oriented uh, places. And uh, the unions continue to be important sources for political support in those particular areas. They are a, an interest group um, a political group that can uh, offer powerful endorsements and can offer a significant amount of money for advertising purposes to candidates uh, with, with, with whom they agree. And so uh, that is a much bigger factor than we see here in Texas. Texas does not have a lot of public or private sector unionization. I mean, it's true that we see it in pockets that are, are relatively small uh, automotive uh, factory component uh, is, is oftentimes unionized. We see this in the airline industry. And again, part of the reason we see in the airline industry is because different rules apply to them than apply to most private sector unions. So there certainly are possibilities of unionization, but it's much less popular. And we'll look at some reasons why it's less popular in a little bit. Uh, but probably part of the reason it's less popular is that um, uh, the culture here is more conservative, is less uh, blue collar focused in terms of industrial manufacturing type things. There's probably also a component of Texans being somewhat individual. Uh, focused and uh, not necessarily wanting to uh, be part of a group, uh, you know, that they may not agree with everything associated with that group, for example. So there could be some concerns about individualism, and this comes up um, in certain parts of, the, of the, the country, and that can be a reason why people aren't as crazy about unionization. Uh, but this could change, uh, certainly. Uh, there has been definitely an ebb and flow to labor activity, and we'll just have to see if um, that's a, a trend that could develop here, as, as it could anywhere. Okay, so now we're going to talk in more detail about the wider. That's kind of the historical component. Now we're going to focus on what actually, uh, what, what remains of the Wagner Act, um, and how that, uh, what, what its requirements are with respect to 
um, employers in the private sector. Okay, um, let's look at the term, uh, I guess that should be term, not unions, I don't know why I put word unions there, sorry. Um, so let's talk about, let's first of all talk about the term shop, stu shop steward. Actually, let's talk about bargaining unit first. So imagine that you have a, um, in your, let's say you're running a factory, and in your factory you have three categories of workers. You only have three hourly paid jobs. One job is widget maker. These individuals screw together the various components to make a widget. They work on an assembly line, and so there's, you know, some of them screw, screw the nut on, some tighten the gear, some quality control or whatever. Maybe they're constantly switching jobs. You know, one person does quality control in the morning and they do gear tightening in the afternoon. Um, there's just one position. They all participate in all jobs at various times. We're going to call that the widget tech. And then we have another group of people who are in the shipping department. They uh, box all the widgets and put them onto the truck. Um, so they had that role. And then we have some front office people who type and file and um, answer the switchboard and uh, greet uh, visitors to the facility as receptionists and that type of thing. Okay, so it ends up that the folks in the shipping department want to, and we'll say that we have um, 50 employees who work as the widget techs. And we'll say that we've got uh, 10 employees who are in the office. And we'll have 10 employees in the shipping department. Well, let's say in the shipping department, um, eight of the 10 people really think a union would be great. Um, they have a supervisor who's a pretty bad jerk. And um, they deal regularly with the truck drivers, and the truck drivers are usually members of the Teamsters. And the truck drivers tell them all the time, hey, look, Teamsters are great. You don't really need the Teamsters. That would make your lives a lot better. And they've really been affected at, effective at persuading these uh, eight of the 10 shipping employees that that is really what's going to benefit their, them, and that is definitely what they want to go for. Uh, the people in the front office are primarily uh, women. Uh, they are rather intimidated by the idea of Teamsters. They've heard stories about Jimmy Hoffa and mob ties and broken kneecaps and things like that. And boy, they don't want to have anything to do with that. Zero of the 10 have, have interest in being part of the Teamster union. That just sounds crazy to them. The widget techs, there's about 20 of them. Well, yeah, we'll say 20. About 20 of them that like the idea of the union. Um, but most, uh, a, a slight majority, uh, really just uh, aren't, aren't interested in the union. They, they have much better supervisors in this area, and they're, they're satisfied with uh, what the company is offering at this time. Okay, so if we look at it, we have... Um, 20 from the widget tech and we have eight from the shipping department who are pro-union. So you can see we have a total of 28 workers who would vote in favor of the union. We have a total of 70 workers though and in order for a union to be voted in you need at uh, of the of the members, I mean, of the employees who vote, and probably not all 70 are going to vote, but we'll pretend for a second that all 70 do vote. Then you want, you need to have um, half plus one. So in that case, you would need to have 36 to vote in favor of the union. Well, you can see the union um, is lacking um, eight that it needs. Now, of course, turn out, turn out, uh, the voter turnout could be lower than 70, so, you know, obviously it could be that they could still win, but it seems like an uphill battle at this point. So what the union might say is, okay, we get it. We're not going to win if it's the whole facility, but um, really what, what we'll go for is we'll go for, we don't want the front office. We're, we don't, we don't need them in our unit. We want our unit to be the widget techs and the shipping employees. Um, that's six, excuse me, that's 60 people, 
we have 28 solid votes you know all we have to I mean if if, if all the 28 people vote in our favor um, then we um, uh, are pretty close I mean, we're gonna have to maybe flip a few other folks but we're pretty close because I mean that would be um, 56 so if if you know if we don't have a hundred percent turnout, but a lot of times the pro pro company people don't end up voting, and so you know we're pretty darn close to a victory. We think we can flip a few more, but let's say as as the matter progresses, they see no. Nope, you know what? The thirty uh, widget techs who um, uh, are pro company just are not going to change their mind. So the union goes, okay, well we don't want the the bargaining unit to include the widget techs after all. We want just the shipping department. And so there's only 10 people who are eligible to vote. We've got eight solid people. All we need is six. And so we, we're pretty good shape. So we want our bargaining unit to be the shipping department. Well, let's see what the definition of bargaining unit is. The bargaining unit is the group of employees in a workplace that have the legal right to bargain with the, the employer. So this is a group of folks who uh, can, as a unit, vote on the union question. And if they decide, yes, we're in favor of the union, then they, these individuals will be part of that bargaining unit. Now, of course, if the union says all we want is a shipping department and the union is voted in, well, then the union isn't going to negotiate about the office folks, and it's not going to negotiate about the widget techs either. All the negotiation will just relate to the shipping department. So how does the court decide? Does the, how does the court, or the um, administrative law judge in this case, who is an employee of the um, National Labor Relations Board, how does he decide what the appropriate bargaining unit is? Should it be all 70 workers who work in this facility? Should it be the shipping department and the widget tech department, those 60? Or should it just be the shipping department? And, and what's the measure, what's the measuring stick that the uh, administrative law judge should, should use? As you saw in my example, the union wants as big a unit as it can have because the more the the num the larger the number of people in the bargaining unit, the more um, union dues it'll be getting, and so therefore union dues are like sales to it. So that's more revenue for the union, and so it wants as big a unit as it can get. Um, if it, that it can win in, I mean, there's no point in going for all seventy and then losing. So you want to pick a unit that's relatively big, but not so big that you're going to lose it. And so you're going to focus on the parts of the facility that are going to more likely support you. And so then, so conceptually, the un the union wants a relatively big unit that it can win in. The employer uh, can go a couple of different ways. It can say, well, we want the biggest unit. We want everybody in this facility because we know there'll be some parts of the facility that are anti-union and some parts that are pro-union and so you can see if the whole unit if all 70 people were voting and there's only 28 people supporting the union then that means that the employer can look at it and go okay we're not going to have any union ice people because and that's what most employers would like ideally and so therefore we want the biggest unit on the other hand sometimes employers say you know what um, we're willing to, to give the union the shipping department. We'll just have that be its own thing. And so, you know, eh, it's maybe not our ideal scenario, but that's, we just know that we're not going to be able to win the shipping department. Uh, but we don't want to lose the widget techs either. So we maybe want a really small unit. Generally, it's the union who wants a small unit, but it's conceptually possible that an employer might want the small unit. So you could have a unit in a facility, meaning a, a, a freestanding unit, that has some employees in the bargaining unit and some employees not in the bargaining unit. And so let's, let's imagine that the, uh, the, the ALJ agrees to having the shipping department being a bargaining unit apart from the office workers and the widget techs. Well, now the union is going to bargain. We'll say it's the Teamsters are going to bargain for the interests of these 10 shipping department employees. And let's say they negotiate a raise of a dollar an hour. Well, now let's then, so let's say this is this advantageous contract. Well, now the widget techs hear about this because obviously they know the shipping employees. 
and they go, oh, wow, that's, that's really great. We'd like a dollar an hour raise as well. And so the widget techs might be interested in joining the union now that they've seen how successful the union has been. On the other hand, uh, maybe the union isn't able to persuade the employer to make the concessions that the shipping, de shipping department employees want. And so maybe there is no collective bargaining agreement agreed to or the collective bargaining agreed, uh, contract that was agreed to just isn't that advantageous for the employees. And so maybe the widget techs were thinking, oh, maybe even the 20 who initially supported are thinking, gosh, that seems like a bum deal. It's not a very good deal for us uh, or for the shipping employees. We're sure glad we're not members of the union. And so the uh, support that had existed among widget techs might decline. So in some sense, the union might see that small unit within the facility as kind of like a a starting point to um, potentially grow the unit size and get other units also um, within the facility kind of it's almost like a piece of advertising for them and if things go well they might be able to persuade more people to join so how does the ALJ decide well should it be the whole facility should it just be this department or that department well the test is do these particular employees share a community of interest these are factors that employees have in common for bargaining purposes. So things that the ALJ will look for is, do the shipping department employees have the same skills that the office department employees have and the same skills that the widget techs have? Do, are, are the tasks interrelated with each other? For example, does the widget tech uh, routinely interact with the shipping department employees and vice versa? Do the widget tech employees interact regularly with the office uh, employees? Or is there a common pay system? For example, maybe you have various steps. Maybe this is level one employee, level two employee, level three employee. And you might start out earning $10 an hour um, as a level one employee, but that could be in the office or it could be as a widget tech or it could be as a shipping department employee. And after you've been there for three years, maybe you get promoted to level two and now you're earning $13 an hour. But again, you could be a level two employee and be working in the office or a level two employee and being working as a widget tech or a level two employee and working in the shipping department and so forth. You can see in that system, there is one pay system for the whole facility and it's established in the same way. Even if you happen to have a job called shipping department employee and widget tech and office employee, if you establish the pay rates in a similar manner using comparable jobs, and if you say increase everybody's pay 50 cents or 25 cents in a particular period of time, uh, those would be pay, common pay systems. Is there common supervision? Um, does the person who's watching the shipping department, does he also supervise some office folks or some uh, widget tech folks? Um, and this could be you know, levels of supervision. Maybe there is just one supervisor for the shipping department, but that supervisor's boss, and we'll call him the, the manager, may also manage the office employees. And are they the same personnel policies across the facility? Um, do they all clock into the same machines? Do they all have the same rules about tardies and lates? And do they all eat in the same cafeteria? Do they all participate in the same benefits? Those are things that would point to a community of interest. So the more things they have in common, the more likely it is that the um, ALJ will say, well, they share that community of interest, so therefore the bargaining unit should include everybody in the facility. Designing company policies in units that could be subject to union activity is a really, really important thing. It's one of the main tools that employers use to avoid unionization. Probably not a big issue in, in Dallas, but if you happen to work for an employer that is in other parts of the country, then Organizing the facility, or not organized, but poor word choice, designing the facility so that you have as much commonality across the system as possible is going to increase the strength of your argument that everyone who is hourly paid in the unit should be part of the same bargaining unit.
And so you, if that is your goal, you want to design pay systems and supervision systems and benefit systems and policies so it's consistent across the system. What, one other way to do it would be to have a job posting system where everybody posts into the same job. Um, to design these things requires a, 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 a conscious set of decisions that you have to make long before there is any hint of union activity. So you have to make decisions uh, recognizing that there may never be any union activity, but you are trying to uh, create the facts on the ground that are going to be most meaningful for you so that you can make the arguments that you want to make if there is eventually a, a union request for an election. So let's talk about what a shop steward is. A shop steward is a union member. So this, this becomes important once the union is voted in. Whatever the bargaining unit might be, we've already decided that those folks, be it the whole unit, all 70 people, or just the shipping department or some other subset of that group, they have voted and they have decided to vote the union in. So now the union is getting ready to start that collective bargaining process. And so it uh, chooses shop stewards. Usually the shop stewards, especially at first, are going to be the folks who were most strongly involved in the organizing. Uh, they've kind of paid their dues and spent time in meetings and campaigning and stuff like that. And so this is kind of a reward that the union is able to offer these folks who have been, you know, kind of good and loyal uh, supporters of their cause. And as time goes by, and of course the union has been in there for years or even decades, the shop stewards are, are going to not necessarily be those in people obviously continuing, but, um, so they can be picked from a variety of mechanisms. But let's consider here, it's a union member chosen as an intermediary between the union members and the em and employer, sorry, another typo there, and employers, um, and can collect union dues and can recruit new members. So imagine, again, going back to the collective bargaining process, the shop stewards are gonna be the folks who are uh, representing the interests of the union in the collective bargaining process. Well, let's say that the collective bargaining process has resu resulted in a CBA, a collective bargaining agreement. And so now there is a dispute. An employee says, hey, I, I posted for job XYZ. I had the most seniority according to the terms of the CBA. I should have gotten the job, but it went to Bob instead. Well, then let's say it's Sally who's saying this. Well, Sally is going to report this uh, violation of the CBA, at least as she sees it, to the shop steward. And the shop steward is going to file a grievance about that. It's going to grieve the matter. And there'll be a variety of mechanisms, all stated within the contract, that explain how that grievance is going to proceed. Um, the shop steward will be there as a resource for the uh, members of the collecting bargaining unit. Uh, when they have complaints, when they feel they're being mistreated, when they might be subject to disciplinary action in the workforce. They are kind of an HR person for the employee um, to kind of make sure that um, employee's interest are, is being reflected. They also collect union dues. Now, once upon a time, collecting union dues was literally the shop store went around to each person and say, okay, you owe me $2.17 for this month. And the, each one of the workers you know, gave them the money. But nowadays, with um, direct deposit and things like that, usually there's going to be an automatic system in place. So the shop steward is responsible for uh, motivating employees to, you know, set that system up. But probably isn't directly going around collecting pennies and dollars from the actual workers. In Texas, this next thing is probably the most important, which is recruit members. Try to persuade members to join the, or try to persuade people to join the union, to become members of the union. Um, 
So that's a very important part of the, um, the face of the union for the workers. So if a union puts shop stewards in that have excellent interpersonal skills who are popular, uh, they're much more likely to be successful than if they have somebody nobody likes. Ah, oh, that person's lazy, that person's mean, that person plays favorites. Um, that's not the type of person that's going to be as successful at being a union uh, shop steward. Uh, we've already used the term collective bargaining agreement, but let's refresh on this. This is the negotiated contract between labor and management over wages, hours, work rules, and working conditions. Um, we already talked about business agent. That's a representative of the union. Um, not necessarily a craft union. I'm not quite sure why that's on there. Really, any union is going to have bitch's agent. This is the employee. He is the equivalent. He is the, he's a campaigner for the union. And he will also assist in the collective bargaining process as well. Okay. So, we're, again, we're still talking about the Wagoner Act, that, that law that was passed in the 1930s. So what did it outlaw? The first thing it outlawed, or at least on this list, is company unions. Let's talk about what a company union is. Kind of seems like an oxymoron. It's like calling somebody the, the um, young senior citizen. Well, either you're young or you're a senior citizen. You can't be both. Well, how can something be a union and be company? That doesn't fit. Well, it used to be the case that um, companies would have kind of this captive union set up. They would say, okay, y'all want a union? Fine, then we'll set one up for you. Uh, but they controlled who was the leaders of the union, who the shop stewards were, and they, uh, they kind of went through the motions of negotiating, but they were really in control of what was going to happen. And then, of course, now that there's a union in place, the, the employees can't get their own union in, and so it was a kind of a way to stop meaningful collective bargaining. So these fake unions were prohibited under this act. And in fact, a company really has to, to be completely separate from the union. So let's say that the Teamsters comes into your facility and your CEO really thinks unions are great things. And the CEO wants to say, well, gosh, I mean, I think this would be great for our employees to have the Teamsters to come in. I want to send a letter around to all of our employees saying, hey, if I were you, I'd certainly sign up with the Teamsters. This sounds like a great plan. Well, um, that would be unlawful. The, the, the company cannot recommend or endorse a union because that's making it a company union. Now, companies can oppose the union or companies can take a neutral position. Either one of those are okay, but they can't lobby in favor of the union. Um, okay, uh, the act identified um, unfair labor practices, really actually this particular statute just identified unfair labor practices of employers. We'll see later on that unions were identified. But again, for the purposes of this, I don't care about you knowing that it was the Wagoner Act versus um, the Landrum Griffin Act or uh, the Taft Hartley Act. I don't care about you knowing which particular statute it is. So don't. So that this is a true statement. Um, it's not true about because the union part isn't true about the Wagoner Act, but I don't need you to know Wagoner versus one of these other statutes. Um, so these are uh, unfair labor practices, ULPs, which have to do with uh, various unlawful practices. Unfair things that employers uh, were doing, could do during oftentimes the collective bargaining process or the election process that um, made the playing field unfair for the employees and for the unions. It established um, the, the election process, how uh, what steps the union would have to take in order for there to be a union election and what role or what actions the employer and the employees could take. It discussed, or the statute covered, what types of strikes employees could take, um, what were lawful ones, what were unlawful ones, and it talked about the duty of the employee, employer to uh, bargain in good faith with the um, union. Uh, so once we once the union is voted in and there's that time to collectively bargain, well, the employer has the duty to bargain in good faith. 
Now that doesn't mean that the union that the employer has to give up anything. It just means that they they have to listen, they have to provide information, and they need to negotiate. But at the end of the day, there is no requirement that either the employer or the union has to agree to any particular term. Uh, during the, the organizing campaign leading up to the election, the NLRB does provide oversight. A, a very common term that you will see in this area is laboratory conditions. The NLRB wants the um, uh, process to be as clean and as fair as possible. Now we've all seen political campaigns when this candidate's running for office or that candidate's running for office, uh, the mud is being slung. Maybe not every statement made is 100% accurate. Oftentimes both sides might mm, kind of shade the truth a bit. Uh, the NLRB uh, it tries to keep it as pristine a process as possible, but um, you know, human nature is human nature. It's not going to be completely pure. The NLRB is um, actually technically the board is just the five people who are on the board, but they have lots of different branch offices, and the people who work in the branch offices are called board agents. Um, many of the board agents, I don't know what percentage, but I'm thinking most are probably attorneys. And they will uh, do everything from uh, handling complaints, unfair labor practice charges, to um, uh, running the elections. And when I say running the elections, I mean being the people who collect the ballots and count the ballots. And the ones who ensure that uh, the count is correct and tells everyone who won the majority. Okay, let's talk about the concept of economic strikes versus ULP strikes. I said over here that they recognize the use of lawful strikes. Well, economic and ULP strikes are both lawful, but they have, but the statute provides very different answers to this situation. An economic strike is completely lawful, but if an employee is on strike, the employer can replace him or her. Um, so let's say that Bob, uh, the union decides to strike and Bob joins and he leaves his workstation and he joins the picket line. He isn't coming to work. So the employer says, well, gosh, Bob didn't show up today. I, we're going to hire Sally, a new employee. Sally's willing to cross the picket line. Sally starts working the next day. Uh, a couple days later, Bob says, gosh, I've got a paycheck. I mean, I don't have a paycheck. I need some money. So Bob says, I want to come back to work. And the employer goes, oh, sorry, we hired Sally. Sally now has your job. And Bob says, well, fire Sally. Let me have my job back. And the employer goes, no, no, we're not going to do that. We like Sally pretty well. I mean, in fact, the employer for an economic trike does not have to fire Sally, the replacement worker. Now, if Bob is willing to return, then the, then the employer has to keep Bob on the list. And so when Sally leaves, then Bob is entitled to Sally's spot. Uh, let's say Sally stays with that, with, with, with that particular facility for six months, then she quits. Well, now Bob has to be offered that position. But it could be that Sally, when she's hired there, stays there for 30 years. So you can see how once Bob starts striking for an economic reason, he may or may not be able to return. Now, of course, if the employer doesn't hire replacement workers, then once the strike is over, the, employ the um, uh, employer is required to re bring back Bob if Bob is willing to come. So how replacement workers, how secure the replacement workers job is, is going to be, it's going to vary between economic strikes and ULP strikes. So let's say instead of the strike being about an economic issue, let's say uh, the union is saying, oh, you know what, uh, we think you ought to earn an extra dollar an hour, Bob. Bob says, yeah, I agree. I think we ought to earn an extra dollar an hour. Well, that's an economic strike. Perfectly valid strike, but it's about an economic matter. Let's say, though, that what happens is that Larry is fired um, because, or the union says, well, the reason that we think Larry was fired was because union, Larry supported the union. And so um, 
that's a, a an unfair labor practice for the for the company to fire somebody because of his support for the union so we want to go on strike bob says yes i agree with you that was wrong what the company did i want to strike for that reason he does go out on strike so the same thing happens he goes out on a monday on strike on tuesday the employer hires hires sally to um take over bob's uh, workstation um Again, Bob starts getting kind of hungry, needs a paycheck, and so five days later, we'll say the next Monday, Bob comes back and says, hey, you know, I want to come back to work. Can I come back? The employer says, well, you know, we hired Sally to replace uh, you, and Bob goes, but I was a ULP striker, and so because I'm willing to come back now, you have to fire Sally, and I, you have to return me to my position once I'm willing. And so under those circumstances, Bob would be correct. So that's a pretty major difference. It's much easier for the employer, employee to come back when the strike is a ULP strike versus an economic strike. You can see for this reason that, in, that the unions like to characterize strikes as ULPs and employers like to uh, think about strikes as economic strikes. So it can be a matter of uh, a fair amount of debate which type is it and so um, obviously many times it's going to have to be the judge who decides and the judge is going to consider well what what were the reasons that the the union told its members uh, when they were maybe voting to strike or not and so again a, a savvy union is going to be uh, presenting both economic and ULP reasons for the strike in the hopes that they will be able to persuade a later judge that it truly was primarily a ULP strike and therefore when the workers are wanting to return they can return even if replacement workers have been selected. Okay so another duty that the union has is the duty of fair representation. The union has to represent all employees within that bargaining unit fairly and non-discriminatorily. So let's say that uh, the union, the shop steward will say is Bob. And Bob's best friend in the unit is Larry. And Bob has never, never could tolerate Susan. They just never got along at all. Well now, since Bob is a shop steward, both Larry and Susan have grievances against the company. Um, they both feel like uh, they were denied vacation pay that they were entitled to. Well, if Bob can play favorites, he can uh, treat Larry better than Susan, and maybe he'll take Larry's grievance and you know proceed with that, but he may ignore Susan's grievance. Under the law, Bob can't play favorites. Now, as soon as I say that, you may be thinking, well, gosh, you know, no statute is going to overturn uh, uh, kind of human nature. And you're right that certainly there are uh, ways to advocate strongly and ways to maybe not advocate so strongly. But in theory, Bob has to represent Larry and Susan equally well. Um, and so that's what the law requires, um, even if maybe Larry is more of a favorite um, than Bob. We'll see how this plays out in a right to work scenario in a little bit. So when there is a union uh, campaign ongoing, when the um, uh, union is attempting to organize, it's very common for the union to ha motivate its uh, uh, supporters to file ULP allegations, um, to file complaints with the NLRB. These complaints in some senses are very similar to the charges of discrimination that we saw under Title VII. Now, the terminology is different. Again, this is a statute that uh, developed in the 1930s, so you'll see some important language differences, but the concept is probably, it, it is very similar. Uh, so you may say, well, what's the motivation behind this? Well, there's lots of motivations behind it. Um, one is that it can uh, motivate the employer to be careful. 
because if the employer fires somebody who's a union organizer and a, a ULP is filed, if the um, National Labor Relations Board accepts that there was a violation, there was a ULP, then the employer may be required or probably will be required to take this person back and also post a notice about it. When the employee, when the employees see that the employer has had to do this, that's going to make the employees perhaps look upon the union and think, ah, oh, gosh, this union is pretty powerful. Look what it can make the employer do. We know the employer didn't want to do this. And so therefore, uh, this union can probably help us out. It, it can make the employer do stuff that maybe we want it to do. So it sends a pretty powerful message to the employees. It can also cause, if there's enough of these allegations, end up kind of having smoke associated with it. It can cause um, the, uh, uh, the the NLRB to actually require that the the, the, the NLRB can 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 find if if there's enough of these very serious matters that maybe it's just impossible to have an election at all because. Um, this employer has acted uh, so much in violation of the law. And so sometimes the NLRB, occasionally, it's not very common, will say, well, we're just not even going to hold an election. We're going to look at the authorization card, something we haven't talked about yet, but just uh, th th there's a, a pre-election process where, where in the union collects uh, cards from people saying, I'm planning to vote for the union. And then the, the union presents these cards to the National Labor Relations Board to support its application to have the union election. Well, if enough people submitted those cards and the uh, National Labor Relations Board says, hey, you know what, this process is so tainted, it's so unfair, people have gotten so concerned about this and so uh, concerned about you know, maybe the maybe the employer is going to do something illegal that that we're just not even going to be able to hold the election because it just wouldn't be fair. So we're just going to look at these authorization cards. And if there's more than half of the people in the bargaining unit have signed with these authorization cards, we're going to assume that's how they would have voted if there had been the potential to have a fair election. So you can see there are several reasons why the union would like to file these ULP charges. Um, uh, to uh, you know, advance its interest in the campaign. A very common action to have happen. Um, so let's look at what the employee rights are under the, uh, the Wagner Act, the NLRA. One, of course, is to self-organize. Um, I've been talking uh, uh, through the lens that the uh, employees are going to approach, or maybe a union is going to approach them saying, hey, we want to help you organize. That's the usual way it happens. Usually, uh, or a common way for it to happen is for the employees, maybe one of the employees has a family member who's a member of a union, or uh, perhaps as a nature of their work, they um, have to work closely with, you know, again, pretty common for the shipping department to be this focus. They work or interact pretty commonly with the truck drivers who may be drop off deliveries or pick up deliveries and so they learn about the union that the truck driver is a member of and so then they they decide hey well we don't really know exactly how to do this stuff and so we need to uh, somehow or another affiliate with a union of course that's not necessary they uh, there are cases where employees have decided to just kind of go their own and establish their own union either way is fine either way is a type of self-organization they can also form, join, or assist labor organizations. You can do these steps even if your facility does not ultimately choose to be unionized. They can collectively bargain with their employer through the representatives of their own choosing. Again, that um, those shop stewards. They can go on strike. Not all strikes are legal, um, but certainly there are many, many categories of strikes that are legal. They can picket. Um, again, that's that process of, of uh, uh, displaying uh, or, or th through uh, uh, acting as a, as a group to communicate to the outside world and to the current employees that they are not going to be going to work and that they are visible, perhaps at the interest of the facility, expressing their views oftentimes through signs that say, you know, on strike or whatever. Then they can engage in other 
concerted activities beyond the ones that we've listed here above beyond you know engaging in self-organization beyond collective bargaining beyond striking and picketing and then finally they can choose to refrain from these activities so nobody has to strike nobody has to picket nobody has to collectively bargain so it's a right to participate and a right to decide not to participate this is the language from section 7 that talks about the right to strike employees shall have the right to engage in other concerted activities for the purposes of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection okay so let's talk about this concept of concerted activity um, when we see the word concerted it means working together um, uh, it, it by definition means there's got to be more than one person involved in it I can't do concerted activity all by myself there has to be at least one other person who's part of that activity so let's consider the things that make up concerted activity concerted activity must be undertaken with or on behalf of other employees not on behalf of an individual employee alone so let's imagine that um, I'm Susan and I um, uh, go to my HR manager and say, listen, um, my supervisor, Bob, um, sent me home early yesterday because he said I was out of dress code, but he was wrong. I mean, uh, what I was wearing was within dress code. He shouldn't have sent me home. I lost three hours of pay. I earned $15 an hour, so that works out to $45. Hours, uh, $45. Um, so that's what Susan has reported to the HR person. That would not be concerted activity. She's the only one who's go, gone to HR, and she's only she's complaining only about what happened to her. Now it would be concerted activity um, if she were to talk about some other workers, or let's say another worker came with her to complain about how Susan was treated. So if it's Susan and Bob who go talk to HR about the way Susan was treated being sent home from work three hours early that's concerted activity or if Susan comes alone but she complains about the fact she was docked in pay and she's also complaining because Timothy was docked pay then that would be concerted activity but when she's the only one complaining and she's only complaining about what happened to herself that's not concerted um, the whatever the activity is that that is concerted has to be related to employees concerns regarding their wages not ages sorry about that <laughs> their wages hours and terms and conditions of employment so if Susan is complaining because um, the employee let's say Susan works for um, a, a, a Apple computer um, and she's complaining because um, iPhones cost too much money and she just thinks that um, Apple should drop the price of its iPhones that would be a smarter business model she'd be able to buy one it would be great for everyone if that were to happen well that is not a, a complaint and let's say that she and Bob and Timothy all get together so there's definitely concerted activity well the price of the product that this company sells is not about the workers wages or their hours or their terms and conditions of employment now if Susan and Bob and Timothy say well we ought to be eligible for an employee discount so that we can buy the iPhone for you know half price or something that would be about terms and conditions of employment so it's possible that um, you know that could be a concerted activity if it's phrased in the right way one thing that's important to keep in mind is that you can have something that seems to be concerted activity but if the employees who are acting concertedly uh, engage in extreme or abusive malicious or defamatory or highly profane activity it can lose its concerted status now I encourage employers not to put too much weight on this um, one thing about labor law is that it's pretty rough and tumble 
um, perhaps because it's a, a blue collar type thing where maybe the language is a bit saltier on the uh, assembly line floor perhaps than might be accepted in a, uh, a, a white collar office environment that we see that uh, most um, administrative law judges aren't going to be too impressed by a little bit of salty vocabulary or a little bit of um, intimidation by employee of the HR professional or something like that. So it really does need to be pretty extreme before you uh, should uh, not consider it concerted activity. One example of concerted activity is when one employee attempts to solicit union support from another employee. You might say, well, it doesn't seem concerted because let's say the set, let's say the first employee is Bob and the second employee is Susan. Well, Susan isn't agreeing with Bob. Bob, Bob is trying to persuade Susan, but let's say Bob is ultimately unsuccessful. Well, then Bob was working alone. Susan didn't sign up for this, but Bob talking to Susan about it is um, designed to, um, you know, encourage her to see this situation a different way. And so that does count as concerted activity, even if he ultimately is not successful. This is one thing that I'm going to flag. I'm going to put like three asterisks here because this is really huge. This isn't a big source of attention in the um, textbook, but potentially it's the most important part of this presentation for you because most of us aren't going to work in a unionized facility. Most of us aren't ever going to see a union campaign in our facilities. Uh, most of us are going to be in a union free or non-union environment throughout our professional lives. And so much of what we're covering in this uh, presentation is kind of interesting, but it's all kind of theoretical and it's not directly relevant. Well, this one is because this point has to do with non-union settings. And that means that um, if, if Bob and Susan come and make a complaint to you, even though there's no union involved, there's not even a union campaign involved, it still counts as concerted activity. So you have to think about this. Let's say two workers come to you to complain about, um, let's say, oh, let's, how about this one? Bob and Susan come to you, the HR manager, to complain about Timothy. Bob and Susan say, well, Timothy um, isn't doing his fair share of the work, or Timothy, uh, it takes too long of breaks, or Timothy is earning 25 more cents an hour than we are and we don't like it or whatever the thing might be. Or maybe they're complaining about the supervisor. Maybe Timothy's a supervisor. Um, an employer might say, oh gosh, Bob and Susan, they complain about everything. They're malcontents. Uh, nobody likes them. Nobody wants to listen to them. Uh, we can just ignore whatever they're going to say. Well, yeah, you, you can as an employer ignore whatever the concerted activity is. You don't have to investigate it. Um, you don't have to do anything with it. But if you choose to uh, take some negative action against Bob or Susan because of the complaint that they made, let's say that you put something in the disciplinary file. You know, Bob and Susan are spreading awful rumors about Timothy, da 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 da. Bob and Susan are, you know, making up stories about Timothy, blah, 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 whatever it might be. In other words, you're taking kind of a retaliatory action based upon Bob and Susan's complaint. That is a ULP. And so even in a non-union setting, there is exposure for the employer for under the National Labor Relations Act when the parties engage, when the employees engage in concerted activity. So, um, and particularly in this like Me Too era, you could face um, complaints based upon Title VII sexual harassment, but you could also face when it's more than one person coming forward with a concerted activity uh, um, con uh, issue. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, most employment attorneys do not walk around looking for concerted activity NLR claims, NLR 
in a lot of claims. Um, those are pretty, that would be a pretty rare thing for, for lots of strategic reasons, but also just simply because labor law is not their thing. They're a, a Title VII person. So you're not probably actually going to see these types of complaints, but technically they would be violations of the statute. So I wanted to flag this for you. This is going to be relevant to your practice, even if you never face a union. So who are not covered by the NLRA? Well, agricultural laborers, remember I said before at the beginning how our system of labor law doesn't include farms. Now you may have wondered at the time, well, why not? I mean, if you have a lot of workers, why couldn't that be unionized? Well, you could imagine statutes that would allow um, agricultural workers to be unionized. It just so happens that our statutory schema doesn't. Domestic workers in homes aren't covered, although, um, certainly in a hotel or um, in a, uh, a janitorial service, but it, uh, actually it's a fairly unionized part of the economy. Employment by a parent or spouse isn't covered. Independent contractors aren't covered. You may recall in one of our earlier modules, we talked about the differences between an employee and independent contractor. And in fact, I talked about the NLRA's definition of independent contractor slash employee. Um, so if you want to refresh on that, you may want to go back to that material. I'm not going to cover it again, but it, it did provide you some information about how that definition plays out. Um, honestly, so you, I mean, you definitely need to know about get a mouse. You have to know about this one, but you already did know about this one. This is the one though that I want to focus on. Supervisors and managers can't unionize. They're excluded from the population. Also owners of the business can't unionize, but that makes sense. I mean, they aren't employees. They own the business. They're on the management side, so it doesn't make sense for management to unionize. Um, so um, supervisors can't, managers can't. And this even applies to low, low ranking managers, people who probably aren't making a lot of big policy decisions. They may feel as much a cog in the wheel as the hourly paid folks. Um, people who are covered are going to be your hourly paid or commissioned folks, the folks who are non-supervisory. It will cover your part-time folks and your full-time folks. Okay, so the National Labor Relations Act established the National Labor Relations Board, which as we said before, is an independent regulatory administrative agency. Um, and there are five members. Um, they are appointed by the president. Uh, they have to be confirmed by the Senate. Um, usually there's a two, three balance, two from, or three from the party who the current president is a member of. So if let's say we have a Democratic president, then there'll be three Democratic members of the board, two Republican members of the board. If we have a Republican president, then we'll have three Republicans on the board, two Democrats. And many times the board's votes are three, two. So having the majority, even though it's just one more, pretty much determines how the vote's going to go. Um, but the board, that's just five people. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of work that we need to have going on on the board. I mean, there's, there's lots of uh, ULPs that are filed. There's lots of elections that need to happen. And so just like with the EOC, there needs to be a significant staff. Um, there's going to be, in addition to the NLRB staff, we're going to see the general counsel, the, the attorney for the NLRB will have lots of staff, including attorneys and paralegals. And there are regional offices. Our regional office is in Fort Worth. Um, there are fewer regional offices of the NLRB than there are the EOC. Um, so it's kind of fortunate that we happen to be this close to um, an NLRB office. Um, we, uh, the NLRB, that, that the statute, the NLRA, uh, covers only labor disputes that affect commerce. You may recall before we were talking about how that def definition of interstate commerce uh, or that we see in the Constitution was interpreted in a different way by the Supreme Court as the Great Depression progressed. And so when the, uh, uh, when the statute was being drafted, 
it had to it had to be drafted in a way that made it clear that the uh, Commerce Clause was the source of the power that the federal government had to regulate labor unions. So it had to include the language that that the labor dispute had to affect commerce. But honestly, virtually all labor disputes do affect commerce. That's not really a limitation. Uh, so that's pretty much of an automatic thing. But the, but the NLRA does not cover governmental employees. Um, so those categories, be they state or federal or local, do not participate in the NLRA schema. So basically any private sector employer other than the carve outs that we've already talked about, things like agriculture, um, the airlines, the railroads, things like that um, are going to be covered and any governmental employee. But if you if you take off those few categories, then what's left in the private sector, the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, does have jurisdiction over. So let's talk about how a, NL, a, a ULP proceeds through the system. So the first thing that happens is that the union or the employer or the employee files a charge with the NLRB. So this, you can see the terminology is even the same. We, we call that same document a charge when we're talking about discrimination cases filed with the EEOC. Once the charge is filed, the investigation begins. A board agent for the NLRB will start investigating it. So that's, again, also very similar to what happens with the EEOC. Um, the, uh, instead of it being called a board agent, the EEOC person would be called an um, investigator. If the investigation reveals that a ULP has happened, then a complaint issues. This part's different. Remember before, or remember with the EOC, they investigated in the vast majority of time, no matter which way they find, it's done. They issue a right to sue letter and then the um, employee gets to file a lawsuit. Yes, occasionally the EOC will file a lawsuit on behalf of the employee, but that's pretty darn rare. This is different though. Um, there is no way that the employee or the union or the employer can ever go to court on its own. The only way this case is going to go far forward is if the board agent decides that a ULP has occurred. And then the board agent becomes the prosecutor in this case. So the board agent is prosecuting the employer or the board agent is prosecuting the union. Um, and I use the term prosecute. Th these aren't criminal matters, but th that is the terminology that's used. It's a civil proceeding, but um, let, let's say that the um, employer has filed the ULP against the union. The, uh, the union and the employers presented evidence during the investigation. The board agent believes that the a union has committed unfair labor practice. The board agent files a complaint and now the, um, uh, the, the matter is going to go to a hearing. Again, we're not in federal court. We're not in arbitration. We are in an administrative law hearing within the National Labor Relations Board structure. There will be an ALJ, an administrative law judge, who will hear the case. He is not or she is not a federal court judge. He or she is an employee of the National Labor Relations Board. The only category of cases he or she ever hears are ones before the NLRB. His or her whole thing is this particular statute. He only or she only deals with labor matters. You might say, well, that seems like a conflict of interest. How can a judge who works for the agency hear a case that the agency is using or has decided to proceed against either the employer or the union. I mean, the board agent is an employee of the NLRB. The board agent has said that there's sufficient facts to support um, that the law was violated. Wouldn't the ALJ just be a rubber stamp of the, of the uh, board agent's initial determination? 
Well, I mean, that could be the case, but uh, the, the ALJ does have a different reporting structure, so they don't report to the same person up in the chain of command. And there really are, within the, within the National Labor Relations Board, it's almost like there's a mini government inside. You have your rulemaking portion, you have your prosecutorial portion, and you have your judicial function. And so they're, they're pretty separate. So uh, the ALJ uh, feels pretty independent or at least um, I think that's generally people's impression about this. He's going to hear evidence. There'll be evidentiary hearing. People will be under oath. Documents can be subpoenaed. It's going to feel very much like just a normal trial. Um, it won't be in a courtroom probably. It'll probably be in a conference room of some type. Um, the ALJ will hear the evidence and then he or she will make a recommendation to the board. And then it, whatever the recommendation is, either there is a ULP or there isn't a ULP. And then uh, it will go to the uh, NLRB. Those five people will hear or read the uh, judgment of the judge and either say, yes, we agree with the judge or no, we don't agree with the judge. Um, if the judge, uh, I'm assuming if the board finds that there was a violation of law, it can file a cease and desist order and order affirmative remedial action. The judge, of course, is going to have recommended that if it was appropriate under the circumstances. So let me present to you a scenario and we'll kind of play it through. So let's say that Bob was working um, for Widgets R Us. Um, Bob was very involved in attempting to get the Teamsters to come in and be the bargaining a representative for his work unit. He was a union organizer. He was working within the org. He was an employee of Widgets R Us, but he was very much wanting the union to come in. And he was talking it up and kind of an instigator, so to speak. Um, Widgets R Us didn't like that. And Widgets R Us fired Bob, didn't want a union organizer uh, working in its facility. So Bob files a ULP charge with the NLRB. Uh, the NLRB assigns it to a board agent who investigates the matter. Uh, after looking at all the facts, the board agent concludes that Bob was, uh, 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 unfair labor practice was committed against Bob when he was fired. And so the board agent issues a complaint. The case goes to a hearing. Bob doesn't have to hire an attorney. The union doesn't have to hire an attorney for Bob. The board agent is flipping from being the investigator to being the prosecutor. And so he's going to, or she's going to um, act like a district attorney in some sense. And so he, he, for free, will be representing Bob's interests. The company, in this case, will have its own attorneys present who will argue that, um, you know, uh, Bob was fired because actually he was stealing from the company or whatever the defense might be. The um, administrative law judge will hear all of the evidence and let's say the administrative law judge concludes that no, an unfair labor practice was committed against Bob. Well, then the ALJ will recommend that Bob be reinstated and be awarded back pay for all the time that he was off work. Um, and then that, so the ALJ's recommendation will go to the NLRB, those five people who have been appointed by some president at some point. And um, then uh, the board will decide whether it agrees with the ALJ or not. Let's say that the board agrees that Bob was um, a victim of an unfair labor practice. And so uh, requires that the employer um, uh, comply with the law. Well, the employer now has the opportunity to go to court, but he can't have, or the employer can't have the whole case heard again in court. So he doesn't go to district court where you'd actually have a trial. He actually goes to the federal appellate court. Uh, the court that ordinary, ordinarily hears appeals. So the, 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 the thing that's like the trial court is going to be that ALJ's decision. Um, and in fact, pick this case just because it's kind of somewhat near and somewhat dear to my heart, a case that I worked on when I was in private practice. Here we have when I was at J.C. Penney's. This is um, this is me when, before I got married. I represented um, 
JCPenney in this matter. We didn't prevail, <laughs> but I think you'll find it interesting. Um, uh, if, if, if you have a, it's not a assigned reading, but you might find it interesting to find out a little bit about how these cases percolate up and uh, uh, kind of the specifics of, of these particular matters. Okay. Um, one thing that might be interesting to you to show you is how long cases like this do percolate through the system. Um, in this case, um, the union activity was in early 1995, and we didn't actually get a resolution in over two years, and that's actually a relatively quick time frame. So uh, justice is not always swift in these particular circumstances. And as you can imagine, the union campaign had been over for a very long time before this um, actually uh, happened. So in the particular case uh, that I showed you right here, um, we ended up in the Seventh Circuit. And the reason we chose the Seventh Circuit is because, uh, it, because we actually filed the, the lawsuit in the Seventh Circuit is that we um, felt that it was a court that would be more advantageous to us because the Seventh Circuit jurisprudence was more favorable than some of the other uh, circuit courts uh, would be. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to end our first lecture. I thank you for your attention. Uh, as always, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is cgroover at colin.edu, or better yet, come by. Um, I'd be delighted to talk to you about uh, labor law. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I very much enjoy uh, talking about the strategic and other aspects of this practice area. I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.